like to give you a little bit of background since our, both of our um, presenters today are from Wilson Sonsini and, uh, and we are absolutely delighted uh, uh, to be uh, um, asked by Wharton to, to be co-presenters, uh, co-hosts of these facilities and I'd like to give you a little background on the, on the firm. The firm is, uh, what, we just passed our 50th anniversary, started by John Wilson in 1960. Um, and we are the uh, premier legal advisor to technology and emerging growth companies uh, worldwide. And we represent companies uh, from uh, just a gleam in the entrepreneur's eye, eye all the way up to multi-billion dollar uh, entities. And uh, we believe that uh, we have uh, an expertise and a level of experience that's unmatched by any other law firm uh, in the world. In almost any uh, high technology industry or any, uh, we'll broaden that to say uh, uh, any emerging growth company, um, the dynamic, uh, uh, unifying dynamic of a lot of these companies is not so much technology but the fact that they burn cash uh, very quickly and uh, they need to raise cash uh, a lot. Uh, but there are lots of um, technology issues too and we have very deep domain expertise in that uh, that area, and our goal is to s is to uh, basically be able to answer every question that comes up um, for the key executives at a high technology company: the CEO, the CFO, the head of HR, the head of R and D, the head of sales, um, um, all the issues that come up for um, those executives. Uh, we represent over 300 public companies, uh, over 150 venture capital and private equity firms, uh, though generally we are seen as uh, usually um, representing the companies more than venture capitalists. Um, we always prefer representing the companies. It's more fun. Uh, it's a longer relationship. Um, we've done more IPOs than any other law firm worldwide. In fact, we're somewhat of a barometer of the technology IPO. Uh, market, and I've got to say we have probably more IPOs going on in-house right now than we've had in the past 10 years, so we're very excited about uh, uh, where things are going um, this year. Uh, we uh, also are a world leader in M&A transactions in technology um, and have done more, uh, uh, more M&A technology transactions than any other law firm. Uh, the flip side of it is our litigators will tell you they also defend more securities class actions uh, than any other law firm in the country. And we joke about we d take the companies public and then uh, we refer them over to uh, the litigators given that uh, you get sued so frequently as a public company regardless of what you've done. Um, and we have offices throughout the United States and starting to be worldwide. I, I won't go through all this list of what we're experts in, but uh, as I said, anything that comes up for a, a, a high technology yeah. company or an emerging growth company. And what I'd like to close here with in this part is just how do we work with startups? I mean, we are a large law firm. We've been very successful. We've grown with the technology industry from uh, about 40 attorneys when I first uh, started working at the firm to about 650 now, I think, somewhere in that range. Um, but working with startups is extremely important for us. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's where almost all of our large clients have come from. It's uh, the future of the business. It's the most interesting because you're seeing um, interesting ideas and it's the most fun to be a part of the team for um, startup companies to when, when there's only three or four entrepreneurs thinking about how to form this business, uh, to be invited in and, and to be an advisor to that is, is uh, a big part of why I do what I do and I think for both of these gentlemen too. So um, we do, um, uh, we try to be very flexible with startup companies. Uh, we have fee deferral arrangements. Um, um, we also offer fixed fee incorporation packages um, to, uh, to try to get you up and running with a minimum of, of um, expense and effort. Um, we also enable you to tap into a very deep level of expertise. You know, with 300 of us doing the work that, that uh, the three of us do in corporate um, uh, advising corporations um, on their um, 
startups and their offerings and their M&A transactions, it's very easy for, if you have a question to call up one of us and for us to say, well, let's see, in the, in the 25 years that I've been at the firm, this is what I've seen, but let me go out and tap the knowledge of the other 300 and see what they've seen and, uh, and come back and, uh, you know, clients will say, well, I've got this situation, you know, this must be very strange. And we say, no, you do this, this, and this. How did you know that? It's like, well, because it came up last week for another client, you know. The, and, and, and we believe that this is where, you know, the size of the firm really helps you as a small company, you know, to be able to tap into this, this depth of experience and depth of knowledge. Um, we also have deep contacts in the venture capital industry. Uh, we work with uh, uh, venture capitalists all the time. We know um, almost all the venture capitalists in the Valley. So when startups come in and saying, I'm thinking about raising funding, who do you, can you recommend any, any uh, of, um, venture capital firms that might be interested? Uh, not only can we recommend them, we can send business plans over to them saying, here's one that we've been working with and, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is um, one that you should look at. Uh, uh, w we won't guarantee you're getting funding, but at least it will get you higher up in the, uh, in the, in the pile that the, uh, that the VCs receive and, and also the VCs feel an obligation to us in most cases to get back with an answer rather than just letting it disappear. Uh, for you. Um, we also offer uh, educational sessions, somewhat similar to, to these, but in, in, uh, in a no variety of topics. Um, a variety, we also send out a variety of legal updates as to what's going on in the, in the uh, uh, legal issues for technology companies. Um, we have deep experience advising employees as they're about to leave their existing companies. How do you do it in a safe way? Uh, without uh, screwing up your startup from the beginning. That are probably one of the ones you talk about. Um, uh, and we really focus on being part of the startup team, not just as legal advisors, but to provide you with what have we seen um, in the way of how is business done in the Valley. Um, we're not accountants, but we know a lot of, ac of accounting. Uh, we're not investors, but we know a lot about what the investors are looking for and things like that. Um, and we also, a big part of our business plan is sharing in the, in the upside of, of our client's success. And as you probably know, most of the law firms in Silicon Valley uh, in, in is quid pro quo for fee deferral arrangements or other things uh, generally ask for the opportunity to invest in, uh, in our companies, in our clients. Um, and uh, most clients see that as, as, uh, as a positive thing in, the, in having everybody in the same team and sharing in the upside. Um, but bottom line is, you know, we, as for startups, we understand that cash is king. And uh, we try to work with you and try to be very flexible uh, on that. And there are no set rules about how we work with startups other than we really like doing it and we really want to make uh, the relationship work. So uh, thanks for the uh, putting up with the uh, commercial there. Uh, we'll kick off uh, the discussion today uh, with Rick Klein and Mark Reinster, who are, uh, along with uh, myself, are members of the Business Law Department at Wilson Sonsini. Um, I'll let you guys uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Herb. <coughs> so, uh, my name is Mark Reinstra. I've been at the firm for almost 17 years and practicing law for almost 20. And uh, I uh, uh, went to the University of Wisconsin uh, undergrad and, and uh, studied industrial engineering and then went to Stanford Law School. And uh, uh, the reason I do what I'm doing and, and have been doing it for the last 17 years is the excitement of, of uh, uh, the dynamic uh, opportunities that our clients present to us. Um, the, uh, the blocking and tackling of practicing law is, is relatively dry sometimes. <coughs> and uh, what, the, what working with startups does is it gives you an opportunity not just to, to practice law and do the blocking and tackling, but to be a partner with the organization and to, to be there when they're whiteboarding, you know, how are we going to address this market? Have you thought about these issues? And, and one of the things that, that gets me excited is, is being able to, to really be there at the beginning stages of a company 
you know, and we incorporate hundreds of companies a year. And so you think about it from a business school perspective, that's hundreds, hundreds of case studies each year in how companies can miss opportunities and have management faux pas and, and missteps that, that uh, lead to failure of a business. Um, and so what we're going to do today is focus on three areas, uh, primarily organization, funding, and operations. Uh, those are just kind of three relatively large areas, but, but certainly uh, fruitful for, for making uh, uh, mistakes along the way and, and hopefully we can help at least sensitize you to um, you know not making those mistakes or at least seeking guidance um, and certainly this is by no means an exhaustive list so I'm sure there are other um, uh, other missteps that, that you can all come up with you're a creative group of people um, and so I'll, I'll have uh, Rick introduce himself as well and then we can start I'm my goal is I'm the John Madden to Rick's uh, Al Michaels, so I'll, I'll put in with my color commentary once so, so you took the bus here this morning? Is yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, so hi, I'm Rick Klein. I've been with Wilson and practicing law for about 12 years. I uh, do everything kind of that a typical corporate partner at Wilson does from small startups to large public companies. I, I often wish that I had Mark's engineering background when I meet with new founders and CTOs, I often get looks of, I can tell you're not understanding a word I'm telling you about this really cool technology. Uh, the flip side is I went to Penn undergrad and got a Wharton degree, and so when I talk to CFOs of companies, which are usually a little later stage, they often immediately say, man, the founder told me you're a moron, but you really seem to get our business model. You understand the, the revenue piece of it, so that, that's a nice piece. And, I often find myself when we talk to startups, right, there's, it, so I started in 99 when it was just crazy and it was the dot-com era and it was all about click-throughs and eyeballs and I'd meet with startups and I would say, okay, but what's your revenue model? And I would get back looks of, why do you care? I, I'm not going to have a revenue model for three years, I'll already be public, I'll be a billionaire, you're asking the wrong question. And it was an interesting for somebody with a Wharton background where everything right, is economics and it's got, there's got to be a revenue model. I, I, for a few years I stopped asking that question because I could tell people didn't like it. That often they didn't have a good answer for it, which for me made them think this is, company's not going anywhere. But it was interesting through the 2000s when I started reintroducing that question and people would say, well here are the three options, here are the three ways I might do it, it might be advertising, it might be and it kind of, I quickly realized like things have returned a l at least a little bit to normalcy. I'm wondering with kind of the, the new <laughs> the new web 2.0 and everything that's going on, I, I think people still are pretty focused on, you know, we need a revenue model. Um, so a as we go through the presentation, we'll start diving in in just a minute. We want this to be very interactive. If anybody has questions, please feel free to, to interrupt, ask questions. I think that uh, always makes it more helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so f first slide on corporate formation. You know, as you're thinking about setting up a company, as, as you're forming it, you know, what are the things to think about? There's a, there's a number of ways that you can screw this up. There's a number of ways that you can set yourself up for success. When I meet with new startups, you know, my initial discussion is always, there is a typical Silicon Valley way to do this where you can look like a lot of other companies to VCs and I often get the question of why would I want to do that. To me, the answer is your corporate formation. Oddities are only going to cause more difficulty in funding rounds, questions, potential discounts on valuation. So, you know, when a client says, no, I want to do everything differently, I try to tell them you're going to have more difficult discussions with VCs, you're going to have higher legal fees. You know, if we set this up with 10 million authorized shares and we issue, you know, 8 million to founders and a 2 million share option pool, you're going to look like you know what you're doing and you're kind of set up for typical rounds. And I can talk about, you know, what dilution you'll likely suffer in Series A, Series B, where we're going to look if we sell the company at this stage, what we're going to look like if we go public. And it, it, it won't play out over the next five years exactly like I lay out for them, but it will often play out pretty close to that. And if it doesn't, I can kind of walk them through. Right. You know, on the downside, here's the stocks. Yeah, but and I think yeah, the, one of the main tech ways. Yeah, there are tons of corp, you know, tons of business organizations that you can come up with. You can be very creative in profit sharing and losses and S corps and partnerships and limited partnerships. But when it comes down to it, yeah, 
elevator pitches only last so long, and in California, because of the earthquakes, the buildings are shorter. <laughs> and so if you have to spend the entire ride in the elevator talking about your corporate structure, you've really wasted your opportunity. What you want is you want to you clear the underbrush, you, we're right down the middle of the fairway, um, no tricks, nothing to worry about, let's go on to the business process and the business pitch. So. Yeah. So, so one example of it, I kind of laid out the 10 million authorized shares. I had, I had one client who I've actually worked with a few times. He's, he was a founder, now he's kind of an angel guy, and he was seeding a company. And he said, you know, instead of the way you just laid it out, I want to start with 1,000 shares, and we'll just divide everything um, by 10,000, and it'll all work out. And I said, I'm happy to do it however you want. I just need to tell you, when you start hiring people and give them an option for 10 shares instead of 100,000 shares, it shouldn't be, we all understand the math, but it's going to be kind of an issue, and here's some other things. And he said, yeah, but I'm going to save a couple hundred dollars on Delaware taxes. So, okay, this is fine. And so it was actually a company that we got formed, founded, and sold fairly quickly. And throughout the, it was only a one-year period, but throughout the one-year period, they ran into a number of issues. We ended up having to do a forward stock split because kind of the things I'd laid out of, here's what's going to go wrong. And at the end of it, when we sold the company, the uh, angel called me and said, just so you know, I now understand you weren't doing it because you have no, no creative bones in your body, and I acknowledge I, I may not have any creative bones in my body. He said, you were actually, the things you had laid out all happened. I promise you the next company I fund, whatever you tell me the numbers are, the, the numbers will be. So it, it's not, there's no reason you have to, and you know, the client is always right, and I will always do it however they want, but I do try to lay out, you know, here's likely what's going to happen as you start hiring engineers. So, so next topics are, are business plans, and, and it, you know, we often see the business plans. I, do, I have some founders who will say, can you help me with this? I haven't done it before. Most know what they're doing or have coaches. Th there's a wide range of business plans that we see. You know, so to me, one thing I always look for is the what's the revenue model and kind of, you know, timeline. And there's, there's a wide range in business plans of, you know, we're going to take over the world within two years. And it's kind of like, you know, I just want to tell you what the VC hears. The VC hears, I have no idea what I'm doing. And so I'm just putting numbers on the paper that are really large. And, you know, I, some people do that and get funded. I, I think if you're too, you know, it's in, we get founders who are very conservative, who come in with, you know, really realistic numbers that they know they can hit. And I say, that's not going to be exciting for a VC. We have others who come in with, you know, kind of off the charts of people are going to discount that so much, they'll have trouble taking you seriously. You know, to me, the, the revenue model, you don't need to know when you're starting that you're going to be at you know, $10 million in the first year, $100 million in the second year. But you do need a sense of how this is going to build and kind of the layer below that. What's going to drive it? What are the key drivers? I think that's right. You know, in, in probably the history of, of startup companies, I think Groupon's probably the only one who's ever hit its projections. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a certain amount of just getting within the range of, of what, what makes sense. Yeah, you know, the other thing uh, on business plans especially is, is you know, the excitement of an entrepreneur and the passion of an entrepreneur um, is usually reflected well in, in the business plan and their vision and their excitement and how they present it. Um, I, I would definitely counsel you to go beyond the group of people that you normally uh, work with and bounce ideas off of. Um, you know, selling uh, pet food through the internet sounded like a great idea <coughs> in San Francisco, um, but it doesn't work as well in Kansas. And, and so make sure that you're getting lots of input from lots of different people. Um, my litmus test is always that my, uh, my sister lives in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and she's a social worker. And, you know, I look at a product or an idea and say, is this something that is going to be exciting or interesting to my sister, and it, that's just one test. But, but make sure you're getting lots of input from lots of people. Don't take no for an answer, but also recognize that um, you know, if you hear a lot of no's, you, you might think about starting another idea rather than investing your time and your energy on that. <coughs> Here's the whole drawn out business plan for 
20 feet into the grass. What, when it comes to you, what do you prefer? Or is it, it gets <laughs> well, I, I, I prefer my clients to get funded. No, um, <laughs> I, yeah. but I, I, would, I would say that the, you, you're right, and it, it's, it, it's a philosophy of the West Coast type style of investing versus the East Coast. The East Coast is, is not to be pejorative at all, but, but is very much fundamentals, you know, what is this and what, is the, what are the execution steps to get to from point A to point B, whereas, you know, lots of arm waving and whiteboarding and, and big ideas are what um, the Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalists seem to, to gravitate toward. And you actually see it not just in what's attractive in a business plan perspective, but you also see it when it comes to the financing terms. The financing terms, um, I think if, if you could say it, you'd say that the West Coast is more of a don't, sm don't sweat the small stuff. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's set up a transaction and we're either going to get a home run or we're going to strike out of the plate, whereas um, in, on East Coast tends to be very careful, very, you know, focused on, on the little details and, and those oftentimes are very, very important, but it's just a difference in philosophy. So I would say um, it depends on what level of business plan you're talking about. If it's, the, if it's your first entree into a venture capitalist, if you're more than 20 slides, you're, you, you've missed your opportunity probably because their eyes will just glaze over. Um, that may not be the case in the East Coast. Yeah, it's, it's interesting from my perspective, so for full disclosure, I'm an East Coast guy from Boston. <laughs> And so I won't make any negative pejorative comments about I'm from the, the Midwest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> though, I, though I do, I mean, it's absolutely true. What I attribute is this to, and I, I, I think this is probably mostly right. The VCs on the West Coast are all engineers. I, they're obviously not. I, I have, I work with some that are finance guys, but they're all engineers. You know, former Cisco Sun, hardcore engineer guys who would go nuts if there's 20 pages of graphs and throw it away and move on to the two pages that tells them what the vision is. The East Coast guys, I think, are more former bankers, finance guys. And so you, most of my clients try to raise money out here. I think in a lot of ways, what Mark's pointing out, it's easier. You know, it, these are generalities. But if, if a founder said to me, I'm talking to two people, one's an East Coast VC, one's a West Coast VC, I would absolutely agree with Mark. You're going to get better, easier terms, much, you'll get the money more quickly working with the West Coast VC because they're not trying to financially engineer what happens in every scenario. They're trying to hit the home run. On the East Coast, it's OK if it's not a home run, but it's a single. I want to make sure I'm getting 80% of the value of this and squeezing the founders so that I have some return for my fund. So I, I think that's why the business plans look differently, because it's kind of who, which audience you're presenting to, whether it's a finance-oriented or a tech-oriented. Yeah, one question. One, one thing I've seen in many business plans is It, it really depends on, yes, they do. Um, it depends on, on um, what, what you're trying to do with the company. So for example, a, um, an enterprise software sales, that's you know, oftentimes $100,000 and, you know, and above, requires a field sales force. It's not a call center kind of thing. And so having thought through how you develop a, you know, a robust sales force that can go out and, and work on a sale for two, three, four months before they can really kind of make headway. And being able to make that investment, that's a different investment thesis than, you know, we're gonna put it in the app store and see how many we can sell. And so, yes, they do care, but it really does depend on the nature of the business. If it's a therapeutics company and you need to um, have you know, sales reps throughout the country, again, it, it feeds back to um, the requirements for capital, and and then therefore, you know, how much profitability you can actually generate from things. The, the other thing I'd add is I, I, I think most VCs looking at a sales plan that doesn't have the right sales coverage would say, I know ops guys, I know sales guys, I can bring in to teach this founder how to sell this. If the idea is big and the market is interesting, they can fill in the dots of kind of those details. So moving on to the next few topics are, are kind of linked, you know, as you're forming the founding team. So I've worked with a lot of different founders who 
you know, want to be magnanimous, want to, everybody wants to be called the founder, right? All your friends are going to want a piece of it. And one thing to think about is you can split the pie today so that it works. And I, you know, I'm thinking of a couple companies that I founded where there were six or eight founders. Invariably, within 12 months, if you have that many founders, some are leading the team, some are maybe pulling their weight, maybe not, and some have left the company. And so just be careful as you're dividing up the founding pot, the, the pie. You know, I have, I'm thinking of one entrepreneur that I've worked with on a few companies that we've started. And the conversation I have with him, he's just, he's such a nice guy. He always wants to share and says, give mine away. And I have to kind of walk him through, remember what happened last time, remember kind of the dead equity and how hard it was for us to increase the option pool. And once you've got VCs that are watching, you know, every point, just be careful, you know, try to limit the founding team. And if there are people who need to be founders, try to not just give them shares for what they're doing today, but think of what they're going to do over the next four years. Because they may be, you know, one example I can think of is somebody who's designing the website. And without this person, I could never get the website up and running. And my answer is always, okay, but six months from now when the website's up and running, what value are they going to add going forward? And the answer is generally actually none. And so I'll say, okay, well, the fact you're going to give them 25% of your company for that much work, think of how much you're going to do after that. You're going to have to hire a VP of sales, engineering, CFO. And just, I, I sometimes feel that, I, you know, I'm kind of the one being harsh and saying, no, that, that's way too much for that person. Yeah. Give them less. But it's just, I've seen how it plays out where when you're too generous up front, and at the end of the day, I mean, I'm, a, I think, a generous person. And so we usually end up in a place where it's a little more than I would say mathematically makes sense but a lot less than, you know, hey, if I'm going to take three quarters, shouldn't I give this person a quarter? No, they're setting up a website. You know, you should either pay them 10 grand or give them, you know, less than 5% of the company. Yeah, I think that that's right. How, how many people understand the concept of vesting? Just so, okay, so, so we, we're in the West Coast. It's, yeah, it's Wharton. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, one of the ways that you, you can address this is, is you've got a group of founders, and I see this a lot with graduate students um, who are just coming out of you know, Stanford or Berkeley or wherever, and they're all excited about starting the company. It's May, they're graduating, and, and they get going and start developing a business plan and start coding and start doing things. They go out and try to raise a little bit of money. It isn't successful, and it requires, you know, kind of pulling out the wallet to, to run the credit card to do things and, and really making a, you know, a deep personal investment. And you'll see people say, you know, I did defer from HBS and, and I'm going to go to, you know, graduate school you in the fall. Yeah, or Wharton or wherever. <laughs> and and uh, um, I, I was thinking specifically of an example where, where somebody did uh, go to HBS three months after starting, starting the company with, with um, you know, a vesting structure that enabled them to, to you know, soak up a bunch of, of equity without doing any work. And so it's, it's critical to have those conversations. Yes, we're all in this together, but let's all be in this together and subject our shares to vesting. And then to the extent that somebody changes their role, changes you know, their commitment to the entity, you, you can address that. Um, in a way that doesn't, you know, have equity sit in, in hands that are no longer providing uh, value to the company. Yep. And so the only thing on that that I say to people, because the vesting will fix that, right? If you have a 12-month cliff and you don't earn anything until you've been working for a year, if you work six months, you leave with nothing. I'll often <coughs> say to the founder, this will fix it, but let's fast forward nine months, this person's provided value and they're leaving. Are you going to be willing to say you got nothing or you know, negotiate the settlement where all they get is 948s. And, you know, I have some founders where I say, my sense is you're going to struggle with that and you're going to end up giving away more. And so let's, let's be more realistic. If this person's going to deliver services for nine months, instead of giving them 100,000 shares that vest over four years, let's give them 25,000 shares that vest monthly because then you're not going to have to have the difficult conversation. I have other founders where they say, I love difficult conversations. Don't worry about it. We could give this up front and I'll get it back if we don't get the value. So the, the last piece on corporate formation, and this is really a mechanic, but the, you know, the intellectual property of the company is generally the most valuable thing at most of our clients. Th there's, you know, people have said, well, what can I do to really goose the value of my IP? And yet, you know, it, then I, I have them talk to kind of patent people and 
patent strategists and but the honest answer is just don't screw it up right this is the place where when you go to sell your company and they look back at the initial IP assignment rights and they say you know of those six founders there's one and I don't think he assigned his IP rights and he was involved in coding and right now that person starts coming forward and you you know back then you thought that there may or may not be something here but now we're looking to sell our company for 300 million dollars and you're having the, the acquirer will always figure this out in due diligence and so it just just be careful as you're starting it up make sure you're very clean and that's something that we certainly focus a lot on yeah. when we work with startups yeah the, you know in other words don't get winklevoss here yeah, you know you, you, you uh, um, the 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 intellectual property the ideas of the company are the heart and soul of the company and so anybody who touches that company needs to commit to transfer the intellectual property into the company the company is the key and so any founder or anybody you know, who says that they're not willing to make that complete transfer into the company and, and collectively join the efforts of the company, you shouldn't involve in the company at all. Um, you know, having them touch your intellectual property and then having claims made that they own a portion of the intellectual property or the ideas of the company is, is a horrible way um, to start a company and it's pretty much guaranteed to fail. Um, if you have a dispute in the first few months or a year of starting a company about who owns the intellectual property, I'll guarantee there's nobody who's going to invest in that company. And so this is, it's corporate hygiene, it's get it done, get it clean, and then move on. Yeah, go ahead. Um, before you move on, sure. um, quick question again on, on the founding team. How do you think about a founding team that includes both founders who will the whole time be there, and people like these big names um, who may act as an advisor, as much as you can, I would tell you that first group are your founders and that second group are your advisors. That's sometimes hard where a big name who's an advisor really wants to be included in the founding group. At the end of the day, it really matters more what are they getting, how much of the company are you getting, giving them. It's much easier to say you're an advisor, an advisor gets half a percent, one percent, than a founder. But it, 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 those people who will, you know, guaranteed help well should help you in the first year, but guaranteed will not after that. The more you can have the hard conversation and say, you're going to add great value, I'm really excited about this, but I need to set up my company for success, and so you know, here's what you'll get, right. the, the better off you'll be. Yeah, I'm kind of cynical on the um, advisory board. Uh, you know, it's the important people we know kind of thing, and you, you, you put them up on your website, and that's about all they do for you. So it, it, it comes down to what are you getting for what you're paying, right? If, if you want to put somebody's name on, on your website because you feel it's important and you're really going to give a 1% of your company away, fine, go for it. But, but my sense is that they're not really going to deliver value. Um, and so the key is get something, get, get the value you're expecting from these people. And that means having difficult conversations about what is your level of commitment? What does that mean in terms of my ability to call you? Are you going to spend you know, two days a month with me going through the business plan or the operations or whatever it is where you're bringing value and making sure that you're getting something for it? Uh, because that's probably the easiest way to, to just give away um, equity without getting anything in return. On that topic, is it common to put an advisor on investment schedule? I usually put them on a four-year vesting with a no, no cliff um, just to have it out there and then um, you know the odds are as a as an advisor they have no real role you actually have to affirmatively kind of terminate that relationship but it at least gives you the opportunity to the extent that they're not returning your phone calls um, that you can actually just say you know we, we're going to sever this relationship here's what you have vested here's what you don't and and move on yeah, so the only other way, sometimes I like the, I do, I do sometimes do the four-year, sometimes I like the one-year, mm -hmm. only because it sets the expectation of if you don't do something for me in the first year, you don't get more. And so instead of 40000 over four years, I'll say give them 10000 in a year, make them earn that, and then they'll get more because sure. I think it sets up good incentives, but I've, I've done it both ways. How do you deal with employees who are non-founders in terms of, you know, like after you've gotten your funding? Yep. So to me, those all that those shares come out of the option pool, 
and they, you know, generally, I mean, a lot of times, it, the, the numbers don't matter other than what I said before, is I, I like it to look how it looks. So a lot of times founder shares will issue for uh, a tenth of a penny, and then the initial options coming out of the pool are a penny a share. So there is some actual but also kind of perceived difference between this is the founding team, they got founder shares, and these are the early employees who also got cheap equity, but a little different. But, but let's, let's be clear on one thing, though. There is no such thing as founder shares. It's all common stock. And so whether you call them founders, if their ego requires them to be a founder, call them a founder. You know, call them whatever you want. Um, as long as- But, but wait, is, now I'm a founder? That 5% <laughs> grant? If I'm a founder, shouldn't that, I get 15%? But, but, no, I, 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 I agree. agree with you, it doesn't but, matter. But right? the, that's, the, that's the, key, is, the key is to, to you know, get the people in and, and recognize what it is that you're talking about. You're talking about equity in the company. And whether you call it founder stock or an option or restricted stock or whatever, it all comes out of the same 100%. And so if you start canning it out, you're giving it away and you're not gonna get that back. In the spirit of kind of not giving out too much, so for employees that don't get options, that don't get stock, um, I've seen companies try to hire them It may be a cost issue. Um, you know, there's nothing about California as it relates to stock options or anything. It would I probably think it's be more. Related to kind of ability to fire them or, uh, I think you can fire people in California almost as easily as you can fire them elsewhere. So you can't. You, there are restrictions on uh, your ability to impose, say, non-competition agreements and things. Um, my sense is, if somebody is doing that, it's more for the economics of, of. Um, you know, how much you're paying them. You know, you don't pay, you know, a, a software engineer in Silicon Valley may get 100000 to $120,000 a year out of college. And my guess is if you went to some place in, you know, not to pick on any particular state, but, you know, Cincinnati or, or someplace in Ohio, you, you may be paying them thirty, forty, fifty $50,000 a year less. So that's oftentimes why people are, are allowing people to, say, work in Ohio as opposed to California. It's not to do with this concept. Though it, the, I mean, you hit on it, right? The, the non-compete, the, the ability to enforce things against employees. There's a spectrum of different states of how much they'll let you. So I'm from Boston. Massachusetts will let you do almost anything you want to, their, to, to your employees. California is very protective. It's a spectrum across, right. yeah, starting and, and, in the east and going west. Right, that's, <laughs> that's right. And California is all, on, all the way in the end. I mean, that, uh, to Mark's point, that's usually not what startups are really focused on where they're hiring employees. I agree it is. So I, I have a client uh, in Pittsburgh who hires engineers from Carnegie Mellon, which is obviously a phenomenal engineering school. And I think for equivalent talent to what people hire out here, they pay a lot less for the engineering talent. Over to funding. No. Nope. Yeah. No. Not yet. There you go. Okay. So funding, I assume, will be <laughs> near and dear to, to this group's heart, and this this group will understand kind of the, the the first bullet that we're talking about is, you know, a lot of times, uh, and, and this is where you know a founder comes in who's an engineer, and I can't understand a word they're talking about about what their product does. I, I I've gotten a little better at faking it, but not great. I start talking to them about percentages of the company, anti-dilution, what are you giving away, and they gloss over and kind of have no idea. And it's, you know, if you, you know, generally flexibility is good, right? There's employees who come in and they'll say, you know, okay, so I'm getting 1% now. I don't want to get diluted down. Protect me for the first three rounds of funding at 1%. And I, you guys will all understand this immediately, but a, a lot of founders don't where it's, the pie is 100%. The more percentages you lock in, the worse it is on everybody else, right? So it just automatically, if you lock in 10% that can't be diluted, as soon as you dilute the other 90, they're gonna get double diluted because you've locked in the 10%. And so things like that, you know, the, the hard part is the founders who don't really understand that will come in and say, but it makes sense. I give them 1%, they're gonna really get diluted. They're gonna end up with 0.2%. And the answer is if they do a good job for you, you will grant them additional options, and you may even keep them whole at 1%, but don't tie yourself contractually to that. It, it only causes problems. The other interesting thing is, 
there is an expectation amongst employees, especially if some of their, this has happened for some of their friends. I come in at a startup, I'm at 1%. You know, the company sells 50% of the company at Series A, now I'm at a half a percent. Well, of course the board is going to re-up me at the next board meeting and bring me back to 1%. So I've had clients who do that after the Series A. All you're doing is setting the expectation that they're going to get it again after the B, again after the C. So I often say to clients, if you're going to grant them additional options, try to tie it to a performance review. So if it's close to the year end, you're going to do a performance review, do it then. And, and try to, if you're going to bring them back up from a half a percent, there'll be some people you may have to bring up to 1% or even more. As much as you can, if you bring them from 0.5 to 0.8 when they had been at 1, they will at least start to understand there is no guarantee that I get back to the 1%. So sometimes people say, no, no, I'm going to do it this round, but I'll never do it again. And then they come back in the Series B and say, oh my god, every one of my employees, I just brought them back from a half a percent to 0.8, and they're all irate that I didn't make them whole. And the answer is, yeah, because you set that expectation. No, I didn't. I just did it once. You know, and it's, well, that's, you do it once, employee think, employees think it's a pattern. Yeah. And the other thing, obviously, to point out to the employee is that, yeah, when you got 1%, it was 1% with a company that was worth a half a million dollars, and now you've got you know, eight tenths of a percent of a company that's worth five million. And the next time it's going to be you own four tenths of a company that's worth 50 million. And so you have to just do the X times Y, you know, X times Y equals Z kind of equation with people to under, have them understand that, that while their percentage ownership has gone down, the value of what they have has gone up dramatically. I'm, I'm one of those I don't understand the dilution process. So okay. if you could just slowly promote, uh, so if you it's it's usually in, in that that is a key and so one of the things that you should do is you might talk in terms of I want to give you one percent of the company yeah. um, and if you've got 10 million shares outstanding it's a hundred thousand shares and and uh, what you say to them in an offer letter for example is I will give you a hundred thousand shares I won't give you one percent and the key is, um, and this does happen quite a bit, where somebody will pull out an offer letter and says, you, gave, you said you were going to give me 2% of the company, and that was six years ago and seven financings ago, and, and they still want their 2% of the company. And so it's critical to talk in shares. I mean, if you, if you make an offer letter, it usually says, we'll give you X hundred thousand shares or, or tens of thousands of shares, which, you know, which represents X percent of the company currently. But the key is, if you've done that, you now have somebody who owns 100,000 shares of 10 million. So let's say you raise money and you actually issue another 10 million shares to a venture capitalist. Now they own 100,000 shares of 20 million or a half a percent. So that's, that's how it works. Yeah, a classic case of this is Computerland, uh, which was about 20 years ago where uh, Computerland, uh, it wasn't an employee situation, it was a convertible note, and the note converted into 5% of the company's outstanding stock without tying it to a particular date or anything like that. And uh, there, this was done when the company was fairly early on, Computerland became a very large, uh, successful uh, retailer of, uh, of uh, computers. And uh, the fellow with the note walked in and said, please convert into uh, into five percent, and uh, they spent litigation for a long time, uh, but eventually uh, they had to pay out five percent. Yeah, and the other Mark had highlighted this. Often, if if the client sends over the offer letter, it says which represents five percent of the company, and I'll always try to insert the word currently. And a lot of CEOs will call me and say, "Do I really have to say currently?" And I say, "Well, think about why you're not." And the reason you're not is going to set an expectation for them that's not what you mean to. And so you can do what you want, but my preference would be let's just be clear up front. You know, if you're trying to avoid the difficult conversation of whether or not they're going to be re-upped, the answer is they're not going to be re-upped, and you really don't want them expecting to be when they're not going to be. So then going into kind of, you know, who do you pick as a partner? You know, I, I like to tell founders you know, at one level, every dollar is green, but at another level, the help that comes with it is very different. And picking the right investors, especially at an early stage, is really important. And especially for new founders, 
it, there are some VCs that can just open unbelievable doors where when you have the question about, you know, do we have the right sales coverage? You know what, I have a sales guy who can come in and answer this question here, you know, call such and such and such and such company. And especially for a new founder, those things where when you're willing to admit, here's my expertise, here are the areas where I don't have it, a VC can, re a good VC can really help uh, fill those holes. The, we talked about earlier the difference between an East Coast and a West Coast VC. I mean, as an East Coast guy, I don't like to kind of favor the West Coast, but I'll often say there are East Coast guys, you know, when they're negotiating a term sheet and you feel like you're negotiating every last detail and you're getting pinched and squeezed, it's just the beginning, right? This is the Series A term sheet. It's only going to get worse when they're in the boardroom, and you're always going to wonder, are they trying to build this thing huge, or are they trying to build it but make sure they, they maximize every little piece of theirs. The really good VCs, they will make sure they protect their limited partners that they get good terms, but you'll never feel it. You'll never, there are board meetings I sit in where it's like, God, you can just see that VC is thinking, ah, this is getting big, I need to jam more money into the company, and starts to talk to the CEO about, you know, we don't have enough of a war chest, we need to, I'll write you a term sheet, and I'll always pull the, the CEO after the meeting aside and say, War chests are nice. I'm sensing this one's going to be expensive. Don't sign the term sheet until we talk about what all the implications are. Yeah. Another thing uh, when you're starting up a company is is to think about, you know, what are the, you, how much money do we need to become successful, and 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 how much do we need to start? <laughs> and um, you you look at businesses, and and oftentimes. Uh, when I ask an entrepreneur, how much do you want to raise? $500,000. Okay, well, for $500,000, what are you getting for that? And you kind of do get those blank stares back. You have to decide what kind of business you're running, how capital intensive is it going to be, and what are those step functions that you can show where you increase the value dramatically to get more money. And so you don't raise, if you need $15 million to make a company successful, you don't raise $15 million immediately. You might raise a million or two million, and does that get you to a prototype? Does that get you to a beta launch? Um, do you, what does that what does that deliver? And then you can kind of map out how much money you should be raising at different times. The reason you do that and need to think about it is, um, right now in, in the funding environment, it's it's relatively difficult to get true Series A financing, kind of a two million dollars or three million dollars without getting any money up front. Um, a lot of the businesses these days are um, you know, apps or games or social something or, or local, meet, you know, local marketing. Or, and, and they're all designed to kind of get up and running relatively quickly with a, you know, some sort of app and they need a half a million bucks. And once they get that half a million bucks, they can go to the next step. Okay, that says you can go out to the angel community and, and talk to people who can write a check for 100,000, 150, 200,000, get a few of them together, raise your half a million dollars and you're off and running. If you're doing a scientific tools company or a semiconductor equipment company or a semiconductor company, you're gonna need millions and millions of dollars. You may need millions of dollars to get your first product up and ready. Talking to the angel investors doesn't make any sense at that point because you're not going to get to that step function in, in proof um, to get the increased value before you run out of their money. And they aren't the kind of people, typically, not always, but typically, who are gonna write the big follow-on check to get to that next level. Yeah, this is my favorite conversation to have with founders, because I, I you, maybe it's kind of the Wharton background, but this is where I think I, we and I feel like I add the most value. Because it really is, you know, as Mark was saying, let's figure out where is the step function. Is it six months out? You know, is it when you have the prototype? Is it when you have your first customer? Is it w when is that and how much money do you need to get there? And then what are the risks? If we miss that, is it pushed out three months, an extra $200,000? Is it six months, an extra million dollars? And let's raise what we need as close to what we need as possible with a little in case we slip, depending on what we think the risk is. But the, if you're telling me in six months the valuation is going to be three times what it is today, of course we'd rather sell money th at that point than we would today because you're going to suffer less dilution. And I, I just think I have the most interesting conversations with my startup clients over that. Everybody's, everybody's worried about dilution uh, and raising money. And I just think this is strategically one of the most important decisions, or maybe 
one of the most important decisions that I can actually help with since I can't help with the product. <laughs> Nowadays in value VCs are actually stepping down doing these 100, 500 k, and then I've heard this debate between a lot of people that which is better, going to a VC for 500 k or an angel, and everybody has different views. It, yeah, I mean to me it depends. There are VCs who step down because they recognize if I write the half a million dollar check, I'm in the door and I'm going to get to lead. If I like it, and they like me, I'm going to get to lead the Series A. It's re I would look at who the VC is. If they are willing to do that and it's going to put them in the catbird seat, as long as they don't get you know, too aggressive rights for their half a million. So you know, one of the things that Mark was alluding to this, there are certain rights that c should come with writing a half a million dollar check that are not the same that come with writing a five million dollar check. Right. right. And so the angels get that. They have to come in and be a good partner to get to participate in the A. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm having this discussion with a few clients now where more, I don't want to use the names of the fund, but more typical funds that would invest the $5 million check are coming downstream. Some of them really get, when I write a half a million dollar check, I'm not going to ask to control the Series A because it's not fair to the company. Others are trying to write the same terms for the half a million as the $5 million. And it, it's not totally East Coast, West Coast. but it, So I think it depends on which VCs you're talking to. If you can get the really good VCs in for writing a half a million dollar check without giving them rights to the Series A that if they don't lead it on terms you like, you know, don't handcuff you, that's great. Because as Mark, you know, the best thing to do is to get in investors who will write you that big check the next time. It just depends. The angels won't write you the $5 million check. If the person who wants to write the $5 million check wants too much for their half a million, <laughs> you got to think twice because if things go wrong, that can really put you in a difficult spot. Because other VCs will look at it and say, ah, that other large fund's already in there. They've got blocking rights. Either I don't want to try to beat them for it, or, and this is often the hardest one, they're already in there. They know something I don't, and they're not writing the, ch the next check. Right? That's a hard one. Right. VCs see so many things come across their desk. That's enough to say, I, I don't know that I want to touch this. So sorry, right. I know. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, just to follow up on this, just quickly. Um, you know, I think actually I read somewhere that Doug Collin was quoted as, as talking about this issue just the other day. Um, and you know, one of the things, you know, the venture capitalists are kind of going and in, in looking at the smaller deals. I think that, that they look at it as, as you know, this, this kind of cauldron, this, this like primordial soup. And some things are going to come out of that. But, but, but I think that there, there is less of a, um, an investment in their perspective, both you know, from the money perspective, but also their time and attention. It's let's throw a little bit of money at this and see if it works. And if it works, great, we'll fund it. But if it doesn't, we only threw you know, whatever in and we'll just walk away. And so I think you may find, um, and it might be the right decision. That might ultimately be the best thing that ever happens to you is that a, a venture capitalist tells you this, is, this dog won't hunt. Right, and go on and do your next thing because that might be really exciting. But at the same time, if you deal with maybe an invest, yeah, an angel base, um, they may stick with you a little longer and give you a little longer um, you know, opportunity to prove out the business model. They don't always work with the first, you know, X months or X hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so, it, it it's a it's a trade off. Both of them bring real value. Um, if you thought your next check had to be five million. I would absolutely do a venture capital route. If you think you can be extremely capital efficient, um, you should really consider an angel investor. Some of the most, the most successful entrepreneurs I have um, worked with raised less than a couple of million dollars and managed to be extremely frugal and capital efficient and, and driving you know, 73 Pintos around because they didn't want to spend any money on anything that wasn't advancing the ball in the business. Is angel money more expensive than VC money? If, um, the question I'm trying to get to is, can more people know what their uh, price is going to be around in the, in the seed stage itself? I mean, do angels price the seed stage or can it get to the there, there, there are some interesting articles uh, written about um, some angels who got together um, and tried to collude to refuse to accept convertible notes, uh, which would be an antitrust violation. Um, we won't go there, but um, you know, 
What we recommend is that it, it depends, or at least what I do, because it, it, you know, there are a number of people in the firm and they have different perspectives, but what we say is, at this early stage, it's close to impossible to figure out what the real value is. I mean, we could be off by a factor of 10, right? It could be 500,000, could be 5 million, we don't know. So what, what we recommend is that first money coming in, whether it's $100,000 from your uncle or whether it's $500,000, that kind of level of investment, I always recommend convertible note with a little bit of common stock equity. And so they get the note that converts into the preferred financing where we have maybe, a, well, we certainly have a more mature company. We may have professional investors who have um, a better perspective on true valuation. That note converts into that, but they get a little bit of extra equity. So no matter what that valuation is, they come in before for taking the additional risk of funding the company earlier. Yeah, and I, so I've been having this discussion a lot lately. There were things, I, I always, uh, maybe it's just because it's easy, but I don't think so. There's kind of a smell test on this. It, if it's a quarter of a million, a half a million, that kind of you know, feels and smells like a bridge. When it gets north of a million, I kind of say it's in between. And if you're north of a million and a half or two million, you're probably creating enough value at that point that you ought to think about a price round. It, there, there's no rule of thumb. And, you know, if, if you said to me, we're going to do a million and a half bridge, but it's going to bridge us for six months, and in six months we will have doubled the value of the company, I would say if the investors are willing to put it in on a bridge now, that's good. I do think at that size you're less likely to find investors willing to not price the round mm -hmm. at that time. So, Mark, I just wanted to make sure I understood what you said. So issuing a convertible note plus with a little extra stock, you mean? issuing the note at a discount? So no. Price, so you would, let's say um, for every dollar you invest, um, we give you an extra share of common. So on a $10 million valuation, you think about 10, or 10 million shares outstanding, we put $500,000 in the company, they're going to get 500000 of 10.5 million, so call it 5% of the company for their convertible note, plus then that note will convert into the next financing. So they get that extra 5% for taking the initial risk. And so usually I tie it off of, you know, a buck for a sh you know, a share for a buck or maybe two, but, but that's about where it kind of lines up usually. Yeah. And mechanically often you do that in the form, you could do it in the form of a warrant, you could you do it in the form of issuing common stock. Right. The other way to do it without giving stock, right, is the discount to the preferred. And that, I'll often lay out all those options for a founder of, uh, the, the nice thing about Mark is it does give them common equity, not additional preferred, which is good for the founder. It also gives them kind of immediate equity. Right. But it, at the end of the day, if I gave somebody 20% warrant coverage or a 20% discount into the round, it's just a question of if the warrant's for common, then it's common versus preferred. Economically, it often feels similar. And so I'll just walk a founder through, here's why you might want to do discount to the next round. Here's why you might want right. to give warrants are common. I do have it, different people who like different in mechanics. Philosophically, and, and obviously there, we can have differences of opinion, philosophically I don't like to give the discount to the next round for a couple of reasons. I have had new money, so you, you, you've got the convertible note, it's going to convert into the financing. You've got new money coming in, they're paying a buck a share. This old money that's now dead because it's gone is, getting, is paying 80 cents a share, but it has what's called the liquidation preference, which means they get paid first at a buck a share. So they're getting actual value that they didn't pay for. And so I've seen outside investors come in and say, I don't like that. They're either paying the same price we are um, or we're not doing the deal. And so it can, that's why I like to give the equity, it's done, the note converts at the next financing. You've eliminated one potential issue down the road. Yeah, and I do think different, different VCs view it differently. I mean, yeah. I, the only, I think I physically cringed a little when you said they're getting value for nothing. They gave money early on at a, at a risky stage, and so I would say they were being compensated for their risk. But right, it, and these are the different views. And, and the you just have to I'll look have at it founder. from the perspective of who's putting in the money at the time. Yep. Any money that's been spent is dead. It's gone. It isn't going to help you anymore. It created whatever it created, and that reflects the valuation of the company. Just to throw in one more thought there, I think 10 years ago, you never would have seen the, the discount on the conversion, you would have always seen warrants because of exactly the issue you raised about 
you know, we're paying good money right now. Why is this person getting getting uh, getting at it less? Uh, but now it's become, I think, more I, than I more. I must be new school. So, yeah. sorry, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and it really does depend. Different founders like different things of different investors. <laughs> so I like to lay out the the different options. Okay, so I know we, we've got about yep. 12 minutes left. If people have questions, please do feel yeah. free to stop us, but we'll try to walk through these. You know, one thing to think of, sorry. We just talked about finding the Yeah, so, so the question uh, for those on, uh, on the internet um, is, you know, uh, is there any general rule on, on you know, who, what VCs to go to and, and do they specialize? Is that the question? I'm, I'm, sure, I think, you know, for purposes of diplomacy, I think that you know, the way to answer that is all VCs bring value. Some bring more, <laughs> some bring less. And I'd be happy to talk to, to you without a camera going about <laughs> <laughs> your particular needs. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very much, I mean, that t to me, th there are definitely, it's hard to generalize. And it, there are funds that are known to be really good partners. I, I don't know that there are funds that are known not to be, but I would talk to people you know, if, if I were out raising money, I would say to a VC, can you give me names, much like I, people ask me all the time, can you give me names of three clients that you work with? Can I call and talk to them about what it's like to work with you? I love when people ask me that, because I think they're, they're then an informed consumer of legal services. I think it's the same thing for a VC. And I would always try to find one person they didn't give me that they worked with. A and I often tell people, if there's somebody else you want to call that I didn't give you, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Uh, and, and you know what I mean? It's just so you can get kind of a what are they really like. In different industries, you get different, but it's very hard to generalize about you know, who's good, who's, who's, who's not good. Great. So we'll try to walk through some of these bullets uh, a little more quickly. The, you know, the, the terms that you set in your Series A are precedential for your Series B. It's very unlikely if you give away the farm in Series A you're going to be able to strip away those rights in Series B. Whatever you give in A, assume that B is going to be exactly that and a little worse because the new VC is going to have their three hot buttons they have to have. And so often a client will say to me, listen, just get the Series A done, whatever, com you know, I want it to be cheap, I want it to be whatever comments come over, accept them. You know, and I always kind of cringe of, this is setting up the value of the company. Let me fight. I I'm somebody, and I think Wilson is very much this way, we want to get the deal done. We understand the client has no desire for lawyers to fight over things that the client doesn't care about. But I do often have discussions with clients of, let me explain to you why these three or four things really do matter. And I can win them quickly. You want me to. If you tell me no, I won't. But here's why you want me to, to clean this stuff up. Because it, it, while in this round it doesn't look that bad, over the next few rounds as you get diluted down further and further, you are going to lose control of your company more quickly and to a greater extent uh, than you want to. So I think we've talked about kind of the fundraising, you know, the aligning it with your needs of, you know, this gets back to kind of the, the step function. It really is, to, to me, I always set it up as a dichotomy of we don't want to run out of cash, but we don't want to suffer too much dilution before we need to. Now let's just figure out on the spectrum. You know, I have some clients who say, listen, I, you know, I, I love bungee jumping. I'm going to raise less money, and I don't care if three months from now, you know, I'm kind of eating dog food and you know, figuring out where the next dollar is going to come from. And I have others who say, oh my God, I won't sleep if I don't think I have enough for 18 months. And so it's kind of along that spectrum. And it, it's it's often, you know, the founders are kind of say to me, what's the right thing to do? And it's if I could tell you what was going to happen over the next 18 months, I'd tell you that. So let's kind of talk about, you know, what things lead up to that decision, and you know, let's talk about where your milestones are where the risks are, and then I can try to help you figure out, if it were me, here's how much I'd raise now, and here's how I'd try to run the company to make sure you get to this next milestone. Because the hard part is if you raise too little and you don't meet the next milestone, that next funding is likely to be really, really painful. And so it's, you either need to raise enough to get to the milestone, or you need to run this leanly enough to make sure 
you get to the milestone. And a lot of the most successful founders have done it before and will be able to bootstrap. I mean, I have one, actually, the client in Pittsburgh, uh, who was able to bootstrap basically what would have been their Series A. And their Series A ended up looking like a Series B, their Series B like a Series C. And it, the CEO called me recently and said, man, when we kind of strategized about how to push off the A for that extra six months, I mean, relative to our last company, look at how much less dilution we've incurred. Yeah. This, is, this is great. Yeah. Uh, one thing also to note is, is in the 17 years I've been doing this in the Silicon Valley, I've yet to have a founder actually tell me they raised too much money. <laughs> and so um, take it if you got it. Take it if you have the opportunity to get it. Um, and, and you know, I will say probably the, the single biggest mistake a funded company makes is, is not starting to raise money early enough. Um, you, know, you get into this battle where, no, 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 the venture capitalists or somebody on the board suggests, no, let's, let's wait. You know, we could always cover you in that interim period. And, and you push it out and you start raising too late in the process and you end up um, yeah, in a situation where um, your, your hand is out and you're trying to, you, you've got an extremely successful company, but you don't have any money to, to run it right now. Yeah, I mean, the best thing to do is to raise money when you don't totally need it because you, it's so much easier to get a competitive. If you can get three VCs fighting over a deal, right, you're going to get great terms. You're going to close really quickly because VCs are very afraid of losing out on hot deals to other VCs. When it's the other way and it feels like we're going to have trouble making payroll, VCs, you know, kind of their eyes light up and it's like, you know, if you're going to, if you want my money, here's a list of 10 things I'm going to do to injure you, right, and it, it, it can be, it can be painful. Okay, so some of the business operations things, I think we've, we've talked about this a little or they kind of make sense. You know, the, I have clients where they'll tell me what they're going to do and they'll spend 18 months designing the product and I'll say, you know, have you gotten any feedback? Have you, nope, don't need it. I know this market. And then they end up designing a market and they go out and try and sell it and it's really just not what the customer wanted. So this is where, you know, I don't know how to go out and do the customer survey, but I know to say it. A lot of VCs who are really successful will talk to companies and say, here's exactly what you need to prove out at this stage in order that we know. When you go to market with a product, there can be no question. It's exactly what the customer wants. You may end up tweaking it in version 2.0, but you're really sure you've kind of hit what the customer's looking for. The other thing that we see, and I, you know, Mark had alluded to semi-companies, and we start fewer semi-companies than we did 10 years ago. They're just so capital intensive, and it's so hard to know, are we going to hit the market? And I, uh, so I spent a year over in China, and one of the IPOs I was working on was BCD Semiconductor, uh, which is an interesting company, got them public early this year. They have gross margins in the low 30s and operating margins in the high teens. And you think about a semi-company with gross margins in the low 30s, it's a US company would lose money hand over fist, right? It's just, it's really hard to start a semi-company. So I work with a semi-company, actually, that we just announced was getting sold. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it, it was so capital intensive and it, it's so hard to figure out how do we spend, when is the gonna market gonna develop? And in a company like that, whether it's a semi-company or just a capital intensive company, if that market moves out six months, 12 months, you can just miss it because that's six or 12 months by the time you built your company, the burn rate can be so significant that it's really the best you can do to contain spending to make sure when you're ready to hit the market, the market's ready for you is, is really important. Uh, and then uh, the, the last bullet on, you know, balancing a collegial atmosphere uh, with fanaticism and execution. You know, it, I, I love working with startups. The energy at a startup is just great. Um, it, there is, you know, a level of we want to have fun, we're not, you know, name XYZ large company, but it really is, you know, ex execution, kind of setting a culture where you meet deadlines, where you con contain spending. It's really important. As you grow larger, those things will not get fixed if they're wrong initially. And so, you know, I have some founders who are kind of fanatical about it. And it, in a lot of ways, that really serves them well. That they, they, you know, really get the culture set. That it's if we're going to have, you know, for a semi company, our tape out done on a certain date, 
we hit that date. And when you start, those things really build on themselves that when you're kind of hitting deadlines and successes, it builds upon itself. When you're not, the culture becomes a place of, you know, well, it's okay, we said Friday, but it's gonna be two weeks from now. And you know, when it's only five people, you can kind of adjust them. When it's 50 people, you know, it gets harder and harder. Right, right. You know, and one thing to keep in mind, um, when you're looking at this, this the startup is, is your baby, and this is a little pitch maybe for the firm too. So you think about a baby, you think about having a baby. Um, you you want to work with with doctors and nurses who've done it before. You know, one yeah. Hey, this is my first baby. You know, and, and so um, you know, I highly recommend that you you surround yourself with professionals who've seen it, who've done it, who can add the experience into the process. And once you, you, you've had the baby and you've got the professional advice, then you have to care and feed for this thing. And you have to be di a discipline. You, you can't be their buddy or you're going to have a, a spoiled child. You need to be very decisive, very regimented in your approach. Yes, you can be a friend and you can be a colleague with, with the people who are working for you. But at the end of the day, you need to set boundaries and rules of behavior and, and expectations, and the way to succeed is, is to set those early and, and to, to live with them and don't vary from them. You're reminding me that I do a much better job with my clients of this than with my boy. <laughs> Jim, yes? One of the Please. aspect of culture that's so interesting is that a lot of entrepreneurs fail to understand the difference between collaborative and participative. So they end up with a situation where they have 50 Everybody has to have a hand in everything. They get nothing done. And it's just amazing how, how often that culture sets in where you, you don't set those boundaries right away. Just to back up what you're saying, it's, it's just so true. It's totally amazing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there's always interesting developments in a startup as they grow. One of the most interesting that we see, you know, we go to kind of monthly or quarterly board meetings. There's that stage when you can't have every employee come to the board meeting and you have to. That's often a difficult transition for a company where employees start to feel, well, wait a minute, are we now becoming the large company? Are we getting? But it's an important e evolution as, as you go through. Mm -hmm. uh, hiring, so people probably the most important asset in a startup, right? And in early stages, and things change as the company goes, right? I mean, could you share some insights, good practices about hiring employees, advisors, and who you want to bring in, and, and how you motivate them? Because you know, the, so the interesting thing is that, <laughs> this may not directly answer, but I'll, I'll flip over. That flips, right? There's a point in time where Google becomes HP and all those people who wanted to go to Google, and Google may maintain this better, and they're a firm client, that, than most, but it, it's interesting as people flip over and, and people want to go to the startups. You know, it, it's... There's different, it depends what you're hiring for, and I, this is one where a lot of VCs are really good at this. There's definitely people who are startup people, where there's people who are really successful at HP that could never do it in a startup because they don't work that way in a startup. And then there's certain roles where it does matter that you were an HP person, not a startup person, and maybe it's, you know, sometimes sales can cut both ways where there's, effective salespeople when they're selling an established product and then there's effective salespeople who just know how to work with startups and kind of are comfortable selling something that may not work today but we'll fix it and it will tomorrow but we got to sell it today and so it, it kind of it depends you know and then there's other industries where it really does matter that you were the HP guy because then you just have contacts that can open doors at all the right places and so I think you need a balance I, to me Startups need enough of the entrepreneurial spirit and people who are just comfortable succeeding at startups. I think when you talk to VCs about a lot of hires, what they'll say is, my favorite thing is when somebody has a history of success at building startups into whatever we want to be. And they look at it a lot of times as, you know, it's one thing to build a, especially salespeople, it's one thing to build a $50 million company. There's a set of people that are really good at that. Then there's a new set when you're trying to become 100 million and 500 million. And it, I've listened to kind of the VCs advise founders on this, where it's really interesting depending on the industry, the size, who you target. But it is important to be thoughtful of, do I want 
only people with the entrepreneurial spirit? Do I want a mix of that and people in industry? A, a lot of times what, what I've seen that seems to work really well is a, a heavy dose of entrepreneurial spirit, especially if you have the right VCs and or advisors that can help open doors slash fill in the, here's what we're going to need to do tomorrow when we're not a $5 million company but a right. $50 million company. Yeah, and, and I would say to a certain extent, absolutely agree, um, that, that the person who wants to go to Facebook probably isn't the right person for your startup. Um, they're doing exciting, interesting things, it, no, no question about that. But, but the person who wants to be engineer number one, engineer number two, the person who wants to be you know, a critical member and a critical component in the success of a venture doesn't go to a Facebook or a Google or even a Groupon or you know, any of these larger companies. They're going to go to a startup where they can be the next guys who did the next thing. And so if they say, you know, Facebook's offering me this, what can you offer? They're probably not the right person. Well, we promised to uh, get you guys out by 9 o'clock, so uh, we're going to end the formal presentation here. Um, my phone's ringing already. You guys probably have things to do. So thank you very much, guys. And <laughs>